In spring 1942, there were 250 Americans of Japanese ancestry enrolled at six California State University campuses. On February 19, 1942, Executive Order 9066 and the military orders that followed forever changed the course of their lives. These young adults, the Nisei, born and raised in California, full of promise and hope, were forced to leave their communities and drop out of college. Some moved to an inland state, but most were rounded up and sent to live in an American-style concentration camp in the most desolate parts of the country. Manzanar, Tule Lake, Topaz, Hart Mountain, Rower, Gila River, Poston, Amachi, Jerome, Minidoka, became their new home for the duration of World War II. After their release, many Nisei never had the chance to return to college. Their dreams of a college education shattered. In the spring of 2010, the CSU located 125 of these former students and presented them with special honorary bachelor's degrees at commencement ceremonies at six campuses. These degrees, although long overdue, brought tears, smiles, and a sense of closure for the former CSU students and the community. The barbed wire fences that imprisoned them and tore them away from their aspirations have now been replaced by the dignity of their very special honorary bachelor's degrees. This degree and ceremony helps restore the dignity and honor of loyal Americans wrongfully removed from their schools, homes, farms, businesses, and careers. They were held against their wills during World War II by their own government without charges or trial. Their only crime was they looked like the enemy. My father's born in California. My grandfather's born in Hawaii. And on my mother's side, they're from the Sacramento Elk Grove area. And they met in camp during World War II. Uh, it was one of those good news, bad news. The bad news was that they were in camp. The good news was that had they not met, I wouldn't be here. So those are the kinds of ways of history. And one of the touchstones in our community is the camps the Japanese were incarcerated in during World War II. It's always a reference point. Uh, eventually, during the conversation with new friends or strangers, even if they're Japanese American, somewhere along the way, the question comes up, were you in camp? If you were in camp, what camp? If you weren't in camp, what camp was your family in? And that becomes just a touchstone for our community. And in the beginning, very few in our community talked about it after the war. It was as described by a second generation Nisei activist named Edison Nuno. He described it as like being a rape victim where you don't want to talk about it, uh, but it has a tremendous impact on your life. Now we will hear from Kazunori Katayama and Frank Suzuki, degree recipients from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. My name is Kaz Katayama. I was born in in Imperial Valley, in the county of Imperial Valley, California, in a little small one-horse town called Brawley, which is adjacent to Mexico. And since my mother had come from uh, uh, upper-class Jap Japan, she, she wanted to move to uh, Los Angeles or in that vicinity because she wanted our children to get a higher education. I was born in San Francisco, and my dad, grandfather, he bought a section of ground here and told my dad to farm. Much as my dad hated the farm, uh, he came grudgingly. And it was 1932, I think, uh, he gave up the farm. He said, you can't make a go of it. So they gave it up and uh, he went sharecropping and bought this place where we are now on a deal that uh, one of the families that owned it couldn't farm it so he moved over here and uh, farmed it. From there he expanded, he expanded from 20 acres to 120 
in a few years. Uh, we moved to Hollywood. From there, uh, we, uh, we spent all of our life. I went through uh, the grade school, junior high school, and high school, and into college, uh, where it was interrupted by uh, the Second World War. We had grapes, peaches, and uh, almonds, mostly peaches. And uh, on the side, he farmed uh, watermelon, sunflower seed, uh, oat, hay, etc., to make a cash crop during those uh, years of I call hard time, depression years. Because he was originally a farmer in in the Imperial Valley, he his he began uh, as a landscaper and a gardener. Folks says. Get your education. Nobody can take that away from you. We all went to Japanese school for a minimum of three years. I heard Cal Poly was an up-and-coming college, and it had a, a, a very high course and good course in ornamental horticulture and plant propagation. Uh, going to college, it was like another dream. I never dreamt anything like this existed. Uh, that uh, I tried out for uh, the basketball team, which I was uh, it was successful in, in being able to get on the team. The interesting thing for me was the experience of those that were going to the college, the university, uh, the state colleges that existed and community colleges at the time. Their, their sense of their future was uh, the proverbial rug was pulled out from underneath them. So it was about finishing up, tying together loose ends, uh, putting closure to and that was the motivation for doing uh, AB 37. Conferral of these honorary degrees is a wonderful idea. It is well deserved and symbolically very important. As someone who experienced internment myself, this cer ceremony has a lot of personal meaning for me as well as you, the honorees. However, I was only six years old at the time went through first through third grades in the Minidoka, Idaho internment camp. If I had been old enough to be in college like all of you honorees, I can only imagine how you must have felt to be forced to terminate your higher education under these traumatic and demoralizing circumstances. Your average age at the time of internment was about 19, and almost all of you were American-born citizens. I'm sure your education in American schools imbued you with a deep belief in such American ideals as democracy, freedom, and liberty, making you among the most loyal and patriotic citizens of this nation. On uh, Pearl Harbor, that morning of Pearl Harbor, we had an assignment uh, with the landscaping uh, uh, corps to go clean the garden. And this was this secretary's office. Sunday morning, we went there with four people clean his yard. And we came back to the cafeteria and all of a sudden the cafeteria was just quiet as we walked in. So I asked my dorm mate, I said, what the hell's going on? Did you hear about it? He says, what? He tells me, poor Harbor. And then I knew all of a sudden that food we had didn't taste that good. So I excused myself and went to the dorm and laid down. I was in college at the time uh, the World War II started. Uh, it just happened that uh, I was on a holiday break. It was Christmas time. That night, no, next morning, my dad called me up. It was about 10 o'clock. I didn't get in touch with him, so he called me later, and he says, can you get some cash for me? I said, what cash? I had about $3,000 in my account. That was my college education fund. At that time, that was big money. And he said, can you draw it out and uh, bring it home? I said, why? He said, my account is frozen. The bank won't let me write no check on it. And he says, looks like you're gonna have to quit school. I said, why? He says, I got nobody to help me on the farm. I can't take care of myself. There it became a general curfew that, that all, all Japanese, regardless of 
first or second generation or whatever, we had to be home by 8 o'clock. From 8 to 5. And we had three different farms that takes me about almost an hour to get home. It's about, about two miles away from here. And one day, I was driving the tractor, it was 6 o'clock, and the sheriff stopped me. He bawled me out, cussed at me, and he says, I told him, what are you going to do? Take me to jail? When I went back to work on a Monday, uh, we were lined up uh, because of the uh, information that I think the, the FBI had learned, that the owner uh, was uh, uh, very friendly with the, uh, the uh, I, I guess you call it the people from Japan. He was taken away in, into a, a separate camp where we were all sent back home. And I went back to Cal Poly, I talked to a few of the other guys, they're all checking out. And they said, they gotta go home. So there's about a good 30 plus of us over there. Only four remained. And uh, the rest of us all came back. When I went back to, uh, to, to college to, uh, to continue, I was sent back home within about 30 days later. And uh, when I got home, uh, they, they, we had an executive order that we had to evacuate f from, uh, from the coast and that uh, we had to, what they call the first interceptor command and that we were either go to an internment camp or go out of this fourth interceptor command, which was off the coast. So my my father had already decided that we didn't want to go to any internment camp, so we decided to leave. We, we stored all of our goods and whatever we had, and we took two cars and, and headed uh, east. Uh, Salt Lake City was the closest uh, uh, city we could go to, so uh, that's where we went. The word of mouth, the word of mouth. And we weren't supposed to get on the telephone, but we still got communications that we were supposed to leave and from A to, to uh, M, I think it was. You go to a certain place, that may, they met at our church. But from M to Z, uh, we were supposed to meet at Merced. Uh, my mother got uh, uh, came down with uh, with uh, uh, some disorder and 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 then she passed away. Uh, but in the meanwhile, before that, uh, I didn't want to do any farming, so I I went to a town called Ogden, Utah. They uh, they checked us out, gave us a number, what uh, shack we're supposed to go into, and. They had a bus waiting for us. We went there, and I'll never forget, I was carrying my kid sister's bag, my mother's bag, and myself. And the guard says to me, you're not supposed to carry three bags. I said, I'm carrying it. And I stomped along, he stopped me, told me to drop it. I said, okay. I dropped all three bags and walked, walked off. And I went into the bus. And then another soldier came, picked up, and brought the bags to the bus. I got a laugh out of that. And I can still remember we went on the train to going through the desert uh, outside of Las Vegas. And they let us all get off to relax. And uh, one of the guys had a football, so we started playing catch. And he threw one way out there, and a guard up to the train. One more move, you're gonna get fired at. I just walked slowly, slowly, I got the football, came back, and I showed the guard the football. He's aiming the gun at me. I just joking, he said, what's wrong, don't you know how to shoot? And he was an older fella. He must have been good, 40 years old. He felt sorry for us, I think. He couldn't pull the trigger. Another instance, we we're playing catch next to the uh, shacks there and the barbed wire there, 
The ball went outside the fence, and there's a tower with a guy with a gun. And I told the guy, can I go after that ball? He says, you step your foot across the fence, I'll blow your brains out. And about half an hour later, I see him sleeping up there. So I crawled between the fence and got the ball. As I crossed that fence, he saw me. He says, he's going to shoot me. I said, go ahead, shoot. And I was holding the ball. I said, go ahead, shoot. Pretty soon, the jeep with three guys come over there. I said, which one of you guys crossed the fence? And we started pointing fingers. He did. About 20 of us. Everybody pointing fingers at each other. It was so crowded in the rooms that we were in, like this, maybe. There's six of us in there, lined up, sleeping, you know, and no privacy. And it got pretty much temperamental. And But this opened up where the people could go out, play, run. It released, it released a lot of tempers out there. In speaking to many Nisei about their internment experiences, I came to realize what a profound psychological impact internment had on them and why so many of them have been very reticent to talk about it, even to their kids. I, I think we were one of the first uh, 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 Nisei to come, or, or Japanese descent to come back to California and that only place that we could find was a ch again was a church that, that uh, we could stay. When I first came back to California, uh, although I wanted to go back to Cal Poly and, 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 and finish my course, my first duty, I, I knew there was not, I wouldn't say a duty, but my responsibility was to my family. Uh, so I, I, there, even though I, I was, it was hard for me to find time to do that because trying to make a living was a full-time job. It is certainly understandable that many Nisei would not want to share such pain with their children, to want to protect them, to shield them from such painful experiences so they could grow up seeing the promise and hope of America rather than its injustices and cruelties. But it should also be noted that even during the darkest days of our incarceration, there were glimmers of hope. I was mad in some ways and thankful in some other ways. Uh, I learned about people quite a bit, especially when we came back, I couldn't get the things I wanted, tractor tires, parts. I found out from, through a friend of mine, go see so-and-so, he'll give you all the parts you want. Those souls over there were so nice to me. I wanted a tractor tire, two days later they're here, put brand new tires on for me. And I wanted a car bad. I didn't have no car, automobile car. So they told me to go see a certain dealer. And I went to see the dealer and he says, it's hard to get, can you wait a month, maybe two? By the end of the month, I had a brand new car. He said, here it is, come and get it. And I went there and I paid him cash. And, and ever since then, for many years, I bought cars through this one dealership. And uh, I thought I owed him because of that. Because I had uh, uh, gone to college before, uh, it gave me enough, uh, I think, uh, uh, confidence, I guess is the word. Look for a nursery that I could start, and I and and that luckily I found one in in Beverly Hill, which, with the help of my dad, uh, I opened a nursery there. And uh, again, I, I guess uh, I can turn to uh, the education I got because uh, by then uh, I, I knew all of the plant by name, Latin names, and everything, and and. Uh, uh, one of the big clients that came in was uh, uh, a builder named uh, Nathan Chappelle, who later turned out to be the biggest uh, builder in the United States, who built with his own money. He, uh, at that one time, he had as much as 30 development going. And uh, he, came, he came in and asked whether I would uh, uh, landscape his backyard for him, which I accepted immediately 
because I had some background at Cal Poly. So I, I went and looked at it and, and I built him a pool, cabana, and, and, and did, the, did the whole nine yards. So he was very pleased and what he did was uh, he asked me to come to his office, which I did, and, and, and I ended up uh, doing all of the landscape for all of his development. And again, that came from the, the knowledge that I had learned in, only in two years in college. I learned how to make a few bucks, and I was more interested in the bucks then, making a few dollars instead of going back to college. My sisters both graduated, and uh, they went on. Uh, but I did. I uh, figured, what the heck, I could make a few dollars farming. Why not farm? Several houses up from her, that place uh, was a home which I was able to uh, do gardening on. Was uh, Kirk Douglas's home, and uh, uh, from there I, I went and, and got uh, some work that Loretta Young. I believe we must remind ourselves of the immortal words of Pastor Martin Niemöller who in recounting his experiences in Nazi Germany wrote, and I quote, in Germany they came for the communists. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics. I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me. And by that time, there was no one left to speak up for me. This prejudice, I think it'll be here as long as we live. It won't go away. You take like the Jews, you take like the Chinese, Mexicans, they all get it. But someplace down there, there's a lot of good come out of it. Well, I, I don't think it's right that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we had to move out. Uh, I think it was uh, more of a injustice, uh, and that. But then we were asked to do this, so uh, we 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 have to go forward, so that our the gen our generation and the, the generation following will have a better life in America. I know some fellows are pretty mad about the whole thing, but they're gone now. So that's it. The history dies right there. The awarding of these honorary degrees will hopefully help make up to a small degree for the involuntary disruption of their education and bring closer to this most unfortunate chapter in their lives. But I also believe the awarding of these honorary degrees is important for the symbolic significance of the message it sends to all Americans. It tells us that part of America's greatness is because it can own up to and make amends for its mistakes. Perhaps more importantly, it also tells us that we cannot take our democracy for granted, but that all Americans have responsibility and have a responsibility and stake in preserving our freedoms and liberties for all groups in our society, regardless of race, religion, or nationality. For me, going to college is not just a possibility. It is an expectation. I know, however, that 70 years ago, the opportunity to go to college was taken away from the Nisei. They had done nothing wrong except for being born Japanese in America. Because of the Nisei's courage, loyalty, and hard work, Japanese Amer Americans are recognized today as loyal Americans. Because of their sacrifices, I will be able to go to college. We must commit ourselves to never again letting liberty and justice be taken away from any American just because the color of their skin is different. Okage sama de, because of you, I am. Thank you for what you have done for Japanese Americans, for all Americans, and for me. You are like a handprint on my heart. I will not forget what the Nisei have done. Congratulations on receiving your diploma. And you have to understand people are people. 
they like you or don't like you, and you live with it. This country is so great because we have all the nationalities bound together. And when things come up, they get together. And it's like the war we had. Look at how many Japanese citizens that were put in the camp went to war. They said they forget about it. They said they got to fight for our country, our country. You know, it's not Japan. It's not just a history lesson. It's uh, not nostalgia. It's not uh, going back. What it is is really going forward. It's a teaching moment to talk about the importance of the Constitution, the importance of people's rights. And no matter the environment, no matter the ethnicity, no matter the gender, the gender preference, whatever, people have these rights at all times as Americans. And you can't take them lightly. You can't, just because the situation may be uh, very negative around a war experience or, or terrorism or whatever the case may be, you can't use that as a reason to trample people's constitutional rights. And as an individual, you have a right of due process. And as an American, you have the protections of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I've accomplished uh, uh, more than anything that I thought I could ever do. Um, I was, uh, it's, it's hard to put in words. Uh, uh, when one day I came back from work and said that uh, uh, I was about to receive an honorary degree. Uh, somehow in, during life, I guess I was looking for something or uh, I guess you could drive me for something, not knowing what it was. But um, uh, I think when I received this uh, news, I, I felt that, uh, that uh, I accomplished something in my life that I've been looking for. I have a lot of faith in this country. I thought about it many days after my daughter pushed me into it. I said, ah, baloney, I don't want it. But one of my daughters says, I oh, should get it because they're going to give it to you. The more I thought about it, my five daughters received a degree, my wife, my son-in-law's all got the degree. I'm the only one, one, no degree. I said, hey, I better get my <laughs> degree. One of the ones I talked to was, uh, his son came out, got the degree, and, and he said, his old man had been real proud to have this, and I'm prouder than he is to receive his degree. That's the way I feel, that uh, I'm one of the family now that I got this degree. In concluding, let me just say to our Nisei honorees that in accepting these honorary degrees, you are speaking up, not only for Japanese Americans, but for all Americans. Your experiences should be both a warning and an inspiration to all Americans. It warns us that the U.S. Constitution alone will not protect our liberties and freedoms, that it's just a piece of paper which is given life only by the efforts and vigilance of all of us to maintain our democratic principles and ideals for all of our citizens. And it inspires us because after the interment, you did not allow yourself to be consumed in bitterness, but through hard work and determination, you rebuilt your lives and helped ensure a brighter future for upcoming generations of Japanese Americans. So on behalf of all Japanese Americans, and dare I say for all Americans, I want to express our gratitude to the honorees and the entire Nisei generation for their fortitude, resilience, and sacrifice that has left us with such an enduring and important legacy. You've heard the never-before-told stories that are part of the history of the California State University and the country. We all must make sure that actions like this never happen to any group of people anywhere again.